Welcome to the podcast, Coronavirus Crisis Carpe Diem, where by God's grace, you and I rise up and embrace the possibilities and opportunities for spiritual and psychological growth right now, in these days, all grounded in a Catholic worldview. We are going beyond mere resilience to rising up to the challenges in our lives and becoming even healthier in the natural and the spiritual realms. I'm clinical psychologist Peter Melanoski, and I am here with you to be your host and guide. This podcast is part of Souls and Hearts, our online outreach at soulsandhearts.com, which is all about shoring up the natural foundation for the Catholic spiritual life. It's all about overcoming psychological obstacles to being loved and to loving God and neighbor. In short, this podcast is all about relationships. It's all about becoming much more relational in our lives and in our faith. This is episode 45. It's released on December 7th, 2020. Thank you for being here with me. This is the ninth episode in our series on shame, and it is titled, How Shame Leads Us to Idolatry. How Shame Leads Us to Idolatry. We're going to dive deep into the spiritual dimensions of shame, the spiritual implications when we give in to a chronic dysfunctional shame. Now, this podcast is all about transformation. It's about a fundamental transformation throughout our whole being, all the parts of us, body, mind, soul, and heart, all of us. It's about transforming the parts that we keep hidden, that we keep secret, even from ourselves. It's about removing the psychological obstacles to following the two great commandments, to love God and to love our neighbor. This podcast is not really about entertainment. It's not about having a good time. It's not just about enjoying a great podcast. It's funny. It's distracting. I, I want the podcast to be interesting, of course, but it's really about transformation. That's really what we're driving at. And this podcast is specifically about developing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, a personal relationship with God as our Father, a personal relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary, our spiritual mother. The fact is that any psychological obstacles that you have in relating to others, any psychological issues that you have in connecting with other people, you are going to bring those issues, you're going to bring those obstacles into your relationship with God as Father, into your relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary as your spiritual mother. Those relational inhibitions, they are formed into you. And until they are healed through experiencing throughout your whole being who God really is, they're going to get in your way. They're going to get in the way of your spiritual life. Why? Because grace perfects nature. It needs something in the natural realm, for to be able to work in our human lives. The spiritual realm is not some sort of special zone, some sort of special place where the natural relational limitations you have are just somehow dispensed and you, they no longer trouble you. No, you are still you in the spiritual realm. You are still you with all your relational issues, with all the problems that you have in connecting in an intimate way with other persons. Any psychological issues you have with your earthly father and your earthly mother, you will bring into your relationship with God as father and with Mary as mother. And this is not something that people often think about. In fact, there was a well-known and respected child psychologist. I don't know if he was Christian. I don't know if he was Catholic. But I was talking to him many years ago about this whole idea that we bring in our issues with our father to God via transferences. And he was like really amazed by that. Here's somebody really well-trained who never made the leap to think that these natural level occurrences, these natural level impediments, these natural level issues would translate as problems in the spiritual realm as well. There are two major dysfunctional 
assumptions in the natural realm for why we don't have a close personal relationship with the loving God. Two big problem assumptions. Two big problem assumptions. Assumption one. The first one is that we do not believe that we are worthy to be in relationship with God, in a close, personal, loving relationship with God. We don't believe that we are worthy to be in relationship with God. And frankly, almost always, that's driven by shame, right? Because shame is the definition of the sense of inadequacy, the sense of unworthiness, So it's shame and our experiences of shame and how we made sense of those experiences that often drive a real wedge in between us and a close personal relationship with God. That's the first assumption. It's the first of the two major assumptions in the natural realm for why we don't have a close personal relationship with a loving God. The second assumption is that we do not believe that God is worthy to be in relationship with us. We do not believe at a bones level, at a gut level, at an intuitive level that God is worthy to be in relationship with us. And this is driven by negative God images. These are the representations that we have of God, often in the unconscious, that drive how we relate with God. And so many of those God images are so problematic. I spent a huge series, uh, episodes 23 to 29 in this podcast, going over all kinds of negative God images, what God images are, and how they impact us, how we default to them, and how they can take over our spiritual lives. Here's the most tragic part, though. We've got these two assumptions that almost all of us have, right? The first is that we're not worthy to be in relationship with God, and the second is that we don't believe God is worthy to be in relationship with us, The tragic part is we stay with those assumptions, even though they're so manifestly problematic and harmful. We don't seek to know something different. We assume that assumptions one and two are actually true when even a moment's reflection will tell us that that belief will lead to major, major problems. So here is the great offer that I am making to you. I'm making you an offer today. I'm inviting you on an adventure, an adventure to discover who you really are, not who you assume yourself to be, not who you think yourself to be, who you really are, an adventure to discover your true identity as a son or daughter of God, a son or daughter of a loving God. And the second part of the adventure is to discover who God really is. This is an adventure to begin to experientially know. I'm not just talking about the head knowledge. I'm not just talking about catechetical formation. I'm not just talking about knowing theology or knowing what the church teaches here about the nature of God. I'm talking about an adventure in learning to relate and to connect with our God who is personal, who is relational, who is loving, who is in fact love himself. So I really want you to think about this. If you really knew deep in your bones who God is, and if you really knew who you are as a child of God, and if you really knew how God saw you in his love, you would run to his loving arms. You really would. But most of the time, you don't. If you're honest with yourself, you don't. You don't know these realities at a deep, integrated level. You know them to some degree in your heads, like I said, in some kind of theological way, this abstract way. We can read the catechism. We can quote the catechism. But what about our hearts? What about our souls? What about our bones? What do we know there? What do we know or think we know by experience? 
In fact, at a gut level, at an intuitive level, the vast majority of us have varying degrees of certainty or confidence and very, very warped assumptions about ourselves, very distorted assumptions about God. These assumptions are wildly different from what God reveals to us about who he is and who we are through scripture, through tradition, and through the perennial teachings of the Catholic Church. In our hearts, in our bodies, in the depths of our souls, in our unconscious, we believe in lies. This is so common, and it's so deadly, and it's so driven by shame, by problematic shame. So let's review. We started this whole series on shame in episode 37. We explored definitional issues a lot in episode 37. That was the first episode in this series of shame. And shame is the primary problem we have in the natural realm, the foundational problem. This is what I argue from nearly 20 years of being a full-time clinical psychologist. The primary problem that we have in the natural realm is this dysfunctional shame. Grace perfects nature. And if our natural foundation is so infused with shame, it makes the foundation for our spiritual lives shaky, unreliable, and uncertain. And that gives birth to so many secondary problems. Those are the problems we tend to focus on. Problems of depression, anxiety, insecurity, anger, guilt, all kinds of things that really are further downstream from the primary issue of shame and how it impacts the way that we understand ourselves and how it impacts the way that we understand God. Shame is a primary emotion, a bodily reaction, a signal, a judgment, and an action. Those are the five dimensions. Those are the five dimensions of shame. So shame is a primary emotion in the heart set. Primary emotions are those that we feel first as a first response to situations. Shame is a real emotional response to a real or perceived abandonment, to a rejection, or to the loss of a relationship. A relationship that we sense, rightly or wrongly, that we need to survive. So that shame is an emotion. Shame is a bodily reaction. This is about our physiological response. Shame takes us out of our window of tolerance into hypoarousal, where we shut down like a deer in the headlights. We disengage, we numb out, we lower the head, we break off eye contact. Or shame can take us to hyperarousal, where our sympathetic nervous system revs up and we get into fight or flight mode. There's all kinds of bodily reactions that can happen around shame that are automatic. We don't think about them. They, they come upon us as part of us being embodied persons. The third, shame is a function. This often gets missed. Shame is a signal that there's a lack of attunement or even a more serious threat in one of, or more of our important relationships. So what it does is shame inhibits other emotions, thoughts, sensations, beliefs, or behaviors that we believe are unacceptable to somebody that we really need to love us, that we really need to take care of us. Shame helps us to learn the boundaries of what is interpersonally acceptable behavior so that we can stay part of our group, so that we can stay in our families, so that we can keep our parents engaged. It's a survival mechanism. It helps to save us from potential terrible consequences. Right. So in that, shame actually has some positive social functions. Shame is a judgment. That's the fourth of these. It's a mindset. It's a judgment about who we really are from the perspective of somebody important who is critical, who is rejecting, who is abandoning, who is evaluating us negatively. We look at ourselves through the eyes of a critical, angry, disappointed caregiver, somebody that is supposed to provide for us, and we realize how they experience us, or at least we, in our perceptual processes, come up with some image of ourselves as being rejected, as being not good enough, as being bad. That brings up shame. Finally, shame is an action. 
as in shaming. It's a verb. Shaming is an action that's intended to cause someone else to feel inadequate, worthless, unlovable, like a loser, for being or doing something that the other person thinks is wrong or undesirable. It's a quick way to control people. It's a quick way to get people to do what we want them to do. We go into detail, much more detail about this in episode 37. So if you're interested in the definition of shame and the conceptual aspects of shame, really check out episodes 37, 38, 39 at the beginning of this series. Some qualities of shame, and this is really important. Shame is hidden. It's hidden from others. We try to hide it from God. It's often hidden from the therapist and it's usually hidden from the self. I've had people say, yeah, you know what? I really don't struggle much with shame. Don't really have problems in those areas. Feel pretty good about myself. I'm a good person. You know, I'm a pretty good person. Feel like God loves me, you know, and so forth. But you scratch the surface. You start asking for access to the deeper levels of that person's psyche. You're going to find that they are also struggling with shame. They're just not aware of it. They're just not in touch with it. If you really knew how God loved you, if you really knew, take a minute. I'm just going to invite you to take a minute right now in the middle of this episode. How would you be different if you had a deep, deep knowing throughout your entire being that God loved you, that he cherishes you, that he wants to be in a close, intimate relationship with you. What would be different in your life? How would your prayer be different? How would your relationships be different? How would your emotional life be different? You know, that anxiety, that depression, anger. So much would be different if you're really going to be honest with yourself. And we are working on being honest with ourselves here. This podcast is going to be work. If you stay with this, And if you actually engage with it as I'm offering it to you, if you choose to come on the adventure, you're going to learn so much about yourself, so much about God, and about what reality really is. Chronic shame, problematic shame, needs to be attenuated, reduced, titrated, ordered, and regulated. You know, chronic shame develops when a little boy or a little girl has this consistent sense of being rejected, unwanted, of being a burden. And the fact is that happens in one way or another to all of us, to all of us. It's ubiquitous. It's part of our human experience. Children change behaviors. They do what they can to be better in the eyes of the adult. And when that still isn't enough for there to be this kind of harmony between the child and the adult the child can conclude that he's just a bad kid, that he's unworthy. The difficulty really is in the response of the caregivers, usually of the parents, but the child bears the burden of the shame, which is caused by that lack of attunement, by that lack of connection, or by the active shaming of the parents. So the child sees parts of himself that are unacknowledged, unacceptable, unwanted, unworthy. Here's the fact. We assume that God responds to us like those shaming caregivers. This is part of our soul set. We generalize from our experiences of shame from important people, from the powerful people in our lives, and we assume that God is like those powerful people. This is called a transference. A transference is a phenomenon in which feelings that a person has about their parents, as one example, or other people that are important to them, are unconsciously redirected or transferred onto somebody else in the present. 
It usually concerns feelings or experiences from childhood that are unresolved, that are problematic, that are trying to be healed. They come up in some other later relationship. And if you're a therapist, you know that this is really common among clients who bring whatever their relational issues are into the real relationship with the therapist, all these transferential feelings, desires, all these impulses, all these attitudes can come up that are really not about what's going on in the present relationship, but are really attempts to heal unresolved relational issues from the past. We assume that God responds to us like our shaming caregivers. And this is so, so common. All of the problematic God images that we discussed in those episodes 23 to 29, all of them have their roots in shame. In all of those episodes, God is treating us in some problematic way that reflects our unworthiness. In episode 37, I said that shame was the silent killer, the silent killer who stalks you from the inside. And shame can lead to spiritual death. Shame is the killer and despair is the murder weapon. Let's take a spiritual view on this. Right. Remember, St. Peter tells us that our primary struggle is against powers and principalities. It's a, it's a, our primary struggle is in the spiritual life. Satan really is real, folks. There's been a big effort in certain mainstream Christian circles to undermine or to de-emphasize demonic influences. And Satan loves this. G.K. Chesterton's talked about how Satan finds it very helpful and useful to be unrecognized, to be unacknowledged. You know, when people do not believe, when Christians do not believe that Satan exists, it moves his agenda forward. He wants to work unobserved. And as this is happening in mainstream Christianity, particularly in mainstream Protestant denominations, it's interesting because at least one theory of psychotherapy, internal family systems, has recognized that malevolent spiritual forces are real. And it actually has a name for them. IFS calls these unattached burdens. It's their rough equivalent for what we would call demons. Satan and the demons want to keep us blind. They want to keep us in the dark and lead us eventually to despair, to a sense of hopelessness. Because if we can get trapped in despair and hopelessness, we will commit a kind of spiritual suicide. Do you remember what Nathanson said, that there are four defensive scripts for avoiding shame? Those four defensive scripts, attacking the self, attacking others, isolating from others, and avoiding inner experiences. We really brought these out in episodes 37 and 38. We're going to talk about those now in the spiritual realm. Attacking the self. This is where we hammer away at our unworthiness. Now, in a certain very real sense, we are actually not worthy of the love of God. Because of our own sins, we are not worthy of the love of God. We actually are in need of redemption. We are in need of God's mercy. If God were only to be just with us, we would be in a lot of trouble. But the fact of the matter is, is that we are beloved children of God. And that's totally incompatible with being overwhelmed by shame. We cannot hold the idea that we are worthless, that we are unloved, and that we are unlovable at the same time as we hold that we are beloved children of God at an experiential level. We can hold those two things at different levels. We can know at some abstract level, some conceptual level that, yes, I'm a beloved child of God, blah, 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 but really I'm unlovable. Is that what we believe in our heart set? The sense that I'm bad, the sense that I'm evil, the sense that I am not ontologically good, that I'm not good in my essence, This is what shame can bring to us, attacking the self. Attacking others, that's the second of the four defensive scripts for avoiding shame. We can 
we can use sarcasm, sarcasm, we can use cutting humor to condemn others, including, including God. People who reject God never reject God as he actually is. They reject God as they imagine him to be. It would be totally, totally, totally unreasonable to reject God if we knew him as he actually is. The only reason we could possibly do that would be out of pure, unadulterated malice, as if we had totally given ourselves over to evil, and really few people ever do that. Our distorted God images are actually attacks on God that allow us to justify cutting off the relationship or distancing ourselves from him. These distorted God images really dishonor God, and yet we default to them, we act as though they are real. We believe them because that's how we came up with an explanation for our experiences. That's how we understood God to be, and it made sense, but our experiences are not the whole story. They don't, they don't tell us what realities really are. We're going to talk about that in a little more detail just a little later. And our different parts, our different modes of operating, each have different God images because they're trying to make sense out of who God is based on what they've experienced and only what they've experienced. The third of Nathanson's defensive scripts for avoiding shame is isolating from others. This includes isolating ourselves from God so we won't be seen, so the shame won't be known, so that it won't be thrown up in our face. It's exactly what happened in Genesis 3, immediately after Adam and Eve sinned by eating the, tr- the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good, of good and evil, they covered themselves and hid in the bushes. Right? They hid from God. They no longer understood him as he really is. They assumed all kinds of horrible things about God. Their God images were corrupted. They hid from God. But what did God do? God came looking for them in the gentlest and kindest of ways. God took the initiative to heal the relationship. God reached out to Adam and Eve. God went looking for them. God let them know he was coming. God provided for them. This is who God really is. This is the nature of God. The nature of God is to love and to be love with us. Shame can drive us to flee from God, to avoid God. And how do we do that? We do that by not praying, by not setting aside time for prayer. We don't enter into relational prayer especially, right? Maybe we pray, but it's a sort of rote, mechanical, vocal prayer. It's not entering into relationship. It's not about deepening our connection, our intimacy with God. It might be done out of duty or a sense of fear or a sense of obligation. It's not about being connected relationally, though. We can also flee from God by not going back to confession. It's a common thing. It's a big one right there. And this is under the fantasy uh, that we will, by our own power, somehow redeem ourselves, somehow make ourselves acceptable to God. Sometimes we we try to do that. We we decide that we're going to really try to grow in virtue so that we can, at some level, be less unworthy, be less undesirable, be less unlovable. That's a kind of Pelagianism. That's a kind of belief that we can merit or earn our own salvation. But what I think is even more common than that is that we don't think about it at all. We just somehow assume that waiting is going to change something, that hiding is going to change something. We're not thinking about the future. We're not looking ahead to see where the road we are on will take us. Our vision is really short-sighted. 
that is very common that when some parts of us are in control, when we are in some modes of operating, there is very little foresight. There is very little connection to the future. That's the third of Nathanson's four defensive scripts for avoiding shame or isolating from others. And the fourth is avoiding inner experience. We are so afraid of ourselves. We're so afraid of ourselves because we don't know ourselves. We do not know at a bones level, at a body level, at a heart level, at a soul level, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We don't know at a gut level that we are ontologically good, that we're good in our essence. And yes, there's been corruption because of original sin, but that original goodness is not vitiated. It's not removed. We are so afraid of ourselves. And what I mean by that is that we have parts of ourselves that are so afraid of other parts of ourselves, parts of ourselves that carry shame, parts of ourselves that carry anger, parts of ourselves that rebel, parts of ourselves that are impulsive, parts of ourselves that have intense desires. We think that these parts are unacceptable. We mistake the parts for the burdens that they carry. And we condemn, we exile, we try to get rid of these parts. We may even try to kill them inside. We are so afraid of ourselves. We have parts that are so afraid of who we are and what we think, feel, what we desire, what our impulses are at deep, deep levels. Now, some of you may be saying, no, not really. I mean, I'm a good person. You know, I know God loves me. Wait a minute. Let me challenge you on that. If you really were not afraid of yourself, why do you spend so little time connecting with yourself? Why do you spend so little time really trying to understand yourself? Why do you spend your time skittering along the surface of life? Very, very few people have a deep, recollected, interior life. So many people are distracted. So many people are caught up in all kinds of bright, shiny objects in their lives. It's worse today than it's ever been because we've got better, brighter, shinier objects than we've ever had before. Social media, the internet, video games. We've got zillions of things that our forefathers never would have even dreamed of to distract ourselves and to bring us away from ourselves. And the more that we flee in this phobic way from who we really are, the more that phobia is reinforced. Phobias are always reinforced by avoidance because there's this sort of fantasy that if I stay away from myself, I can continue to survive. We avoid our inner experiences we avoid them in so many different ways. Some of us get very busy, very busy, even with good things, right? Very busy. Every parish usually has one hyperactive person who does everything in the parish, who's involved in so many committees, involved in so many ministries, is busy, 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 busy with everything, but actually getting in touch with who they really are and who God really is. When we're that busy, when we're that driven, it's like we are just trying to keep one step ahead of our shadow of shame. Satan loves our shame. He cherishes it. Satan wants us to not become aware of our shame, to keep it outside of awareness, to keep ourselves distracted because then we're low maintenance for him. He doesn't have to do a lot then. For people that are caught in this shame cycle, 
and who are busy defending against it, suppressing it, not acknowledging the reality of it, not connecting with who they really are. He doesn't have to do very much. Those folks are already on a road that's going to lead them to not resolve these deep things and that given a a long enough time, will lead to eventually despair and hopelessness. I think this coronavirus crisis has accelerated that for a number of people, has sort of, have taken away some of their bright, shiny objects, the things that they use to distract themselves, and has laid bare some of the issues that they're struggling with. And that, the coronavirus crisis, the lockdowns, and all the things that go with it is a gift. Satan wants us to be low maintenance. He wants us to be caught in prisons that we maintain ourselves. Parts of us act like prison guards to contain, suppress, silence the parts of us that carry shame. When we believe that we are the ones that have to save ourselves, that we are the ones that have to redeem ourselves, that we are going to try to do this by growing in virtue, that we are going to you know, steal our will in order to grow big enough to be able to overcome our problems so that we can be presentable to God, so that we can merit the love of God, we are giving in to a kind of spiritual pride because it doesn't work that way. It may feel safer that way because we actually don't have to relate with God if we're going to try it that way. We don't need the help of other people. We are focusing on self-reliance, on pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but that will never, ever work. That doesn't work. That's not Catholic. That's some kind of self-help, you know, enlightenment-informed humanistic approach. It's not Catholic. And that kind of approach gets peddled so many times, especially by those that sell self-help books. It's not real. It's not true. It doesn't work. It's prideful. You know, and these negative God images, they work to pride too. Why would we rely on ourselves? unless we had really negative God images. If we really understood God as he was, our inclination would be to go to God, not to rely on ourselves, because of who God is in his essence. The antidote to this problematic shame is love. That's the one thing that disarms shame. It's the one thing that overcomes shame. Love is what rescues us from shame. Love transforms us. It makes us immune to anyone who would try to shame us. People can no longer have power over us by manipulating our shame if we have a deep sense in our entire being of being loved. That's why it's important for us to plumb the depths of who we are. It's not so that we can get involved in some sort of self-indulgent psychological navel-gazing. It's not because we just become self-absorbed and just wrapped up in ourselves and who we are and blah, blah, blah. We No, no, no. This is about allowing the love of God to permeate the entirety of our being so that there are no special reserves where shame hangs out untouched by the love of God, untouched by our own understanding and our own will, untouched by love. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God is made up of such as these. Love heals us from the shame. It's not our own effort. So we're going to talk about God's love. Now, as I was praying about this episode... It came really clearly to me, and I'm not super mystical about these things, but once in a while, I will get something to pass on to somebody else. And this is the message I got from God to include in this podcast. This is a message from God as Father to the listeners of this podcast. And this is what God said. Begin quote. I want a relationship with you right now. As you are, 
with all the parts of you, with all of you, including all that you consider undesirable in you, I can heal all of it, but not without your permission. End quote. There is nothing that is too dark, nothing that is too shameful, nothing that is too dysfunctional, nothing that's too distorting for God to accept in you and for God to heal in you. So we're going to talk about healthy ways to deal with shame. Healthy ways to deal with shame because we've all got this. This is part of our fallen human condition. It is the number one natural level obstacle. It's the thing that gets in the way of us connecting with God in a deep, loving, child-to-father relationship. So what is the number one thing we need? And I'm going to be drawing heavily from St. Teresa of the Zoo on this, the little flower. We need a childlike trust in God. We need absolute confidence in God. We need to start there. That's not where we finish. If we intend to finish there, We're never going to get there by our own efforts. We need this absolute confidence in God, especially in God's love for us as a good father for a little child. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God is made up of such as these. We need this childlike trust in God in order to overcome our shame. We need to be small. We need to be like a little child. We need to be like a parvulus. Let's go back to episode 30. If you really want to get into how small are we supposed to be really, episode 30 of this podcast was all about childlike trust in God. Once in a while, I'll recommend a book. And I really like this book, The Complete Spiritual Doctrine of St. Teresa of Lisieux by Father Francois Jamart. The last name is spelled J-A-M-A-R-T. He is a Carmelite. It was published in English. The English translation was published in 1961 by the Society of St. Paul. What this book does is it actually systematizes all of St. Teresa of Lisieux's work into a really organized, systematic presentation. It's really wonderful. Childlike trust in God, that absolute confidence in God, is the, is the core of, of the little flower's spirituality. It's the core of what we need to do in the spiritual life. She says, In order to belong to Jesus, we must be little, But there are few souls who aspire to remain in that littleness. In order to belong to Jesus, we must be little, but there are few souls who aspire to remain in that littleness. We need to be small. We need to be much smaller, like infants, like toddlers. Go back to episode 30, review that if it's helpful to you. St. Teresa of Lisieux My peace consists in remaining small. Hence, when I fall on the road, I can quickly rise again, and Jesus takes me by the hand. We want to be big, though, because we believe at a gut level that it's safer to be big, that we have much more security in being competent, in being organized, in being powerful, in being talented and being capable and having skills and knowing what's what and knowledge. And we want that power that comes from being big. We envy at an unconscious level, usually God's omniscience and his omnipotence. We want the knowledge. We want the power. We want to be big. We don't want to be a sheep. We don't want to be a little child. We don't think that's safe. We unconsciously assume that being small is deadly because we were small at one point and bad things happened. We were small at one point and there was unattunement. There was relational injury. There was even abuse. Psychological, emotional, physical, sexual, bad things happened and we attributed it to us being powerless to get ourselves out of those situations. So we want to be big. We believe that it's safer. But what does God say about that? What does God tell us about that? In Proverbs 
chapter 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. Right. I like the Dewey Rames version better because it's more literal. And it says there, have confidence in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not upon thy own prudence. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on the constructions that you've created, most of which have their roots from long before you reach the age of reason. If you want to know what really drives people, it is not logic. It is not what's in the catechism. It is the assumptions that were formed into them before they reached the age of reason. And most arguments, most debates that happen internally or externally have to do with values, with assumptions that were formed into us before we could even access reason. This is part of our fallen condition. I see this all the time. And it's not just in people that come in in psychological distress. It's in people that come in, you know, that have to go through routine evaluations for security clearances or seminarian candidates that are going through a routine evaluation for admittance to seminary, for candidates for the religious life. You see the same thing. Have confidence in the Lord with all thy heart, is what wisdom tells us. All thy heart, not just your mind, not just some sort of abstract you know, conceptualizations. I will tell you that some of the most difficult clients I've had are those that have had the most advanced degrees in philosophy and especially in theology. Those that have studied these things, those that have compensated for a lack of relational connection with God by studying who God is. Because you can still keep him at arm's length and have PhDs in theology, PhDs in philosophy, PhDs in spirituality, in church history, in whatever. We want to be big because at a gut level, we think that's safer, but it's a kind of suicide. It's a kind of self-destruction. Nothing pleases God more than for us to trust him like a child, like an infant or toddler and a good father, knowing by faith that he will provide for all our needs. That honors God much more than anything else, more than any penance, more than any mortification, more than any sacrifice, more than anything else we could give him, is that absolute confidence in him, that childlike trust in him. This is the essence of the spirituality of the little flower. And I hated that spirituality for about 30 years from when I first came to know it as a young man and thought, oh, this is so saccharine. This is so, this is such the hysterical rantings of a 19th century French woman. No, this is the essence. She made it clearer than anybody else, I think, about how little we actually need to be in order to find peace and joy, and well-being in relationship with God our Father. Because this is the nature of the relationship. It is a sheep-to-shepherd relationship. It is a little child-to-father relationship. But that's not how we operate. We're not going to feel it at first, too. It's going to be based on faith and hope. We need to ask for those things. St. Teresa of Lisieux says, quote, In order to remain a little child, we must expect everything from our good Lord, as a child expects everything from his father without worrying about anything. In another place, she says, The thing that pleases Jesus when he beholds my soul is that I love my littleness and my poverty, and I have a blind hope in his mercy. This is the thing that connects us with God. We're not going to feel it at first. We want to trust in ourselves. We want to become worthy by our own efforts. We want to reach for that omniscience and that omnipotence. And maybe we don't want to become like just God of the entire universe, but just God of ourselves to protect ourselves. It's understandable. We've had traumas. We've had relational injuries. We've had things that have taught us that it's not safe to be small. That's why we need the revealed 
word of God. That's why we need revelation. Because we aren't going to figure this out on our own. We're going to stay on that hamster wheel trying to be big enough, strong enough, powerful enough to be safe. And it doesn't work. It never works. So the number one thing is this childlike trust in God. Absolute confidence in God, especially in God's love for us as a good father. What else do we need? Humility. We need humility in addition to that childlike trust and absolute confidence in God. St. Therese of Lisieux said, quote, If I am humble, I am entitled, without offending the good Lord, to do small foolish things until I die. Look at little children. They constantly break things. They tear them up. They fall. And, the, and all the while, in spite of that, they love their parents very much. Well, when I fall in this way like a child, it makes me realize my nothingness and my weakness all the better. And I say to myself, what would become of me? What would I be able to accomplish if I were to rely on my own powers alone? St. Therese of Lisieux is the singular shining example for not needing to be big, for embracing the smallness and the littleness. She's a doctor of the church. She's recognized as, the, as a doctor of the church. Such wisdom. And what does she tell us about sanctity? What does she tell us about holiness? She says this, quote, Sanctity does not consist in this or that practice. It consists in a disposition of the heart which makes us humble and little in God's arms, conscious of our weakness and confident even unto audacity in the goodness of the Father. A disposition of the heart which makes us humble and little in God's arms, conscious of our weakness and confident even unto audacity in the goodness of the Father. We will never escape our shame by looking inward just to ourselves. We need confidence in the goodness of our Father. So we need the childlike trust in God We need humility. We also need repentance. We need to shift our vision from our own sins, our faults, our weaknesses, our failings, our limitations, our shame to God's goodness and to his love for us. We need to trust in this before we feel it. You know what this really reminds me of? It reminds me of the 1989 film, the Indiana Jones film, The Last Crusade. And there's a scene in there called The Leap of Faith. And the villain says to Indiana Jones, It's time to ask yourself what you believe. And Indiana Jones steps out into this chasm. There's this this huge ravine, drop of hundreds of feet. He steps out. He leans into it. He steps down. And then the narrow bridge appears. Not before then. Then, in that moment, the narrow bridge appears. He looks to himself like he's committing suicide. But in fact, if we don't trust in God in this way, if we don't step out into that chasm, if we don't put ourselves into his hands, that's the spiritual suicide. Because think about where you're going to go if you continue to hold on to your shame. Think about where you're going to wind up if you keep going the way you're going. Really ask yourself. This is a wake-up call. This is a call to totally revolutionize the way you look at yourself and the way that you look at God. You do not have to do this on your own. It's part of the reason why I feel called to do this podcast. And this isn't really just about the spiritual stuff. This one's a little more spiritual. Most of the tough stuff I'm talking about is psychological It's what's formed into us before we get the age of reason, before we hit the age of reason. St. Teresa of Lisieux, it is only when his children ignore their constant lampses and make a habit of them and fail to ask for his pardon that Christ grieves over them. But he is full of joy at the sight of those who love him and after each fault ask his pardon and cast themselves into his arms. Again, like little children. 
I'm about six foot two and a half inches tall, about 220 pounds. You know, I cannot imagine me at my full size casting myself into the arms of Jesus. I can't imagine getting a running start at the size that I have and leaping into his arms. I can only imagine that doing that if I'm small. If I'm small, I'm not supposed to go to him as a big shot psychologist, right? With a PhD and a license from the state of Indiana and all that. That never works. Part of the reason I am a psychologist and have the degrees and have the licensures is because I tried for years to figure this out on my own, to get big enough to save my own soul. I am telling you this, dear listeners, from experience, I have probed into the very best things that non-Catholic approaches can offer from all different kinds of philosophical traditions, from all different kinds of epistemologies, from all different kinds of spiritual traditions. What kinds of things would save me from having to be a little sheep? from having to be a little child because that is not safe is what so much of me screamed for so long. Decade upon decade. And God waited for me. Waited for me to figure it out. It wasn't until just a few years ago that I came across St. Teresa of Lisieux. It's a very gradual process for me. We need to abandon ourselves to the mercy of God. St. Teresa of Lisieux. I have learned that the way to Jesus is through his heart. Consider a small child who has vexed his mother by a display of bad temper or disobedience. If the child hides in a corner through fear of punishment, he feels that his mother will not forgive him. But if instead he extends his little arms toward her and with a smile cries out, Love, kiss me, Mama, I will not do it again. Will not his mother press the little one to her heart with tenderness and forget what the child has done? And yet, though she knows very well that her dear little one will misbehave again at the first opportunity, that means nothing if the child appeals to her heart. He will never be punished. If we're little, we're irresistible to God. If we're little, we're irresistible to his love. He cannot resist loving us. This is the message of St. Teresa of Lisieux. Now, one could be cynical and argue that, well, she had two saints as parents. Her parents were saints, canonizable saints, wonderful people. That's true. There was still... Actually, it's really interesting. There were still pretty significant lapses of attunement between Louis, Louis Martin and his daughter. You know, and she did lose her mother when she was really, really little. I'm really going to invite you to take this to prayer. Really going to invite you to enter into your experience of shame. I'm going to ask you to change up whatever you're doing to distract yourself from it, whichever the approach is that Nathanson describes to avoid it. I'm going to ask you to stand and be with it. Now, again, you don't have to do it alone. You do not have to do this by yourself. This is the kind of work that we do in the Resilient Catholics community. And we are actually making progress with that. I actually came down with COVID-19 on November 18th, and I am still recovering from it. It has really slowed me down. I have not made as much progress on the overhaul of the community in our new directions as I would have liked to. That is all coming, though. We're going to make it. It's, that's, that's got some great plans, doing some, some work on that. If you have, are not a member of the Resilient Catholics community, there is a uh, waiting list that you can sign up for at soulsandhearts.com backslash RCCD. You can also reach out to me, 317-567-9594, crisis at soulsandhearts.com. I love to hear from listeners. 
I want you to share this podcast. I want you to bring this to people who are willing to be the leaven to leaven the church, who really want to overcome the psychological obstacles to this deep, personal, intimate, real relationship with God. Not on our own terms, but on the terms that God has set out for us. Because there's so much better than what we can cook up with our feeble imaginations. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has ready for those who love him. It is absolutely true. I became one of the biggest people I have ever known in terms of human talents, you know, psychology, all of that. It doesn't work. That approach does not work. This works, and it doesn't just work for me. When I look at people who are successful in terms of being able to overcome their issues, it's not because they got big, because they got powerful, because they got strong, because they got competent. It's because they got small, and they allowed the healing to happen by a loving father, the divine physician. Share this podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Amazon. It's all out there. Put it out there to people that you think you would know it. Don't give it to people that you think just are going to like ignore it, skitter it across. Most people are not going to respond to this podcast. They're going to hate it. They're not going to want to hear this. This podcast isn't for them. It's for the leaven. It's for the 2% of Catholics that really want a deep, emotional, relational connection with God, who want that with their entire being, who Or who want to want that, right? You don't actually have to want it. You have to just want to want it. We'll help you through that. Get involved with the community. Get on the waiting list. There's going to be all kinds of great things that happen in 2021. So much more than we've already been doing. For those that are in the community, this Wednesday is second Wednesday, right? We got the Zoom meeting, December 9th, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to be discussing shame and the spiritual life, the topic of this podcast. With that, let's invoke our patroness and our patron, Our Lady, Our Mother, untire of knots. Pray for us. St. John the Baptist, pray for us.